Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to lecture six of quantum computation, PH eight seven zero. In in this class so far, we have been uh, we have talked about um, the basic ideas behind classical classical and quantum computation uh, gates and um, circuits and so on. And then I talked about well, okay, all of this. This is this is old stuff. I guess I don't need to go over that. So then I started talking about the mathematical uh, prerequisites that are needed, which are linear algebra, basically. And it comes under the name of quantum mechanics, but it's actually all just linear algebra, okay, vector spaces, but special kind of vector space, which is the complex vector space. And so because it's a complex vector space, you have two kinds of vectors: kets and adjoint kets. Also known in the, in the literature as brass, but uh, I feel it's a time for a change of uh, uh, what do you call it terminology, right? It's time we update it to something a little bit better. So I'm going to call them adjoint kets. Okay, and so we have these these op uh, operations. We have inner product, um, expectation value. Um, so on and so forth, right? So these are all the very, very, very basic things. So you should have, uh, you should feel completely comfortable with this notation, okay? And the one way to do that is to do all of the basically in chapter exercises that are given in Eastern and so on. All right. So I have given some of those exercises to you as a, as a, for your homework assignment, but you know, you should. So you should def you have to do the ones I have given you, but you you should definitely do the ones which I have not given you. Also, okay. Um, etc. Et then we so I've talked about the circuit uh, representation. Okay, what happened? Not updating. Let me know if at any point my voice cuts out or if there is a gap or a break in my presentation. So I've talked about how to take states into operators, how to uh, right, using this outer product, uh, right? So, so, so this kind of thing, let me, this kind, this kind of a notation, this represents an outer product, right? So you make a matrix by uh, multiplying a column vector with a row vector, right? Then I've talked about the circuit, uh picture and Graham Schmidt orthogonalization uh, and then uh, Cauchy Schwartz inequality. That's what we did in the last uh, lecture. And then a, I, I talked about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, again, this is very basic linear algebra, all right. Uh, this object is a is a matrix. This object is a vector. This object is the eigenvalue, and this is the same vector. Okay. And in quantum computation, we'll only be dealing with finite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces, so you don't have to worry about operators like d by dx and all of that. Okay. Everything, all operators are just matrices. Uh, if there is any any reason to talk about uh, continuous operators uh, or, or infinite dimensional states for some reason, I will let you know, okay? So you can find the characteristic function by taking the determinant of this, of this matrix for any, uh, for any operator A and um, get the eigenvalues and then the fundamental theorem of algebra tells you that, uh, this is a polynomial uh, equation of degree n, and so it, ha it has to have n roots at least. Uh, then Hermitian operators are very, very important. They are self-adjoint operators. So basically they are matrices um, such that it, so if, if they were purely real matrices, they would be symmetric, right? Because the dagger operation would just become the transpose. But because of we have complex um, numbers, so it, it, these are complex symmetric, you can call them, or conjugate symmetric or something like that. 
they have these two very important properties that their eigenvalues are real and the eigenvectors of a Hermitian matrix uh, form an orthogonal basis of the given vector space. Okay, and so I proved both of these statements in the last class and uh, these proofs uh, you should know. Okay, uh, these, these are very important. Okay, you should work to them and maybe you might not remember them, but you should at least work to them so you, so you, you know, you absorb about going one. Then I talked about the big concept of diagonalization of, of a matrix, which has to do with the choice of basis, right? So you have some basis of uh, eigenvectors. In that basis, you find the matrix element for any operator. And if uh, this, these eigenvectors are eigenvectors of the same operator, then these, this matrix is obviously going to be diagonal, right, by definition but some other matrix is not going to be diagonal, right? So you can choose a different basis, which corresponds to the eigenvectors of the second matrix. And in that case, in this basis, the matrix elements of the second matrix will be diagonal, but the first one will no longer be diagonal, right? So this is, this is known as the process of diagonalization. So one can always choose a basis in which any given matrix, as long as it is, as long as that matrix is invertible. Invertible means that it is, its determinant is not zero. And so we call such a matrix non-degenerate um, or invertible. Okay. And again, if you have questions, uh, I will try to keep checking Mentimeter from time to time, but I might miss it sometimes. Um, so, you can also remind me, okay, what's going on. All right, then, then a few more uh, concepts that uh, we need to, we need to go over. And so what are those concepts? Let's see. Um, all right. One is uh, the concept of unitary operators. Um, projections or projectors, I should say. projectors, um, we talked about eigen, uh, and then uh, we have to talk about uh, tensor products. Okay, so without, and, and then once we talk about tensor products, from that point on, we can start talking about uh, quantum gates and circuits. Okay, and the reason for this, is that you can't really do anything useful, computationally speaking, with uh, a single qubit, with a single system, right? So you need more than one qubit. You need a composite comp quantum system. That composite quantum system uh, can be formed only by taking a, so the way it is formed is by using this operation called the tensor product, which we, are, we have talked about briefly. Okay, all right. So let's see, you know, what are unitary operators? So now, um, okay. So one of the uh, aspects of quantum computation is that uh, you, you, we can state it as follows, that dynamics So what is dynamics? Dynamics is tells you how a quantum state changes over time. So 
this is one one word summary of uh, quantum computation that dynamics is computation right so what uh, do i mean by by dynamics dynamics means uh, that how a system changes over time right with respect to time okay so in quantum mechanics dynamics is given by what is called the schrodinger equation okay now so you don't actually in fact even need the need to use the schrodinger equation to talk about quantum com, uh, quantum computation uh, but this helps because it allows us to introduce the concept of unitary operator so uh, what does computation involve right computation involves taking some quantum state of a system right and then evolving it performing some some operations on it which represent some uh, whatever you know different which which can be interpreted as various uh, logical operations right so this quantum state it encodes our our data our initial input to the system and whatever there might be some ancillary or auxiliary data that might be needed for the computation uh, to be successful right and then we perform whatever operations are needed we get a final state right and then once we get that state right then we perform a measurement and this measurement gives us the result of our compute computation right so this process where we are performing this operation right this process is corresponds to something dynamic right so this is dynamical evolution the quantum state is undergoing a change right so there are some uh some constraints on on how you you should describe this dynamical evolution so first of all since psi of t2 and psi of t1 now remember they are all in the same vector space right we are we are never leaving that vector space we are all in this one hilbert space so psi of t2 and psi of t1 both of them are in a hilbert space h right so they must be related to each other by the in, by the action of some operator right so all any computation any transformation they all correspond to to the action of some operator right some linear operator now uh what should be uh what what criterion should this should this operator satisfy okay so uh, before talking so for that it helps to go back and think about dynamics okay so as an example i'll give you the quantum state of a spin one half system okay which is given by this right and we'll say this is at time t is equal to 0 all right and then we evolve this system okay so we evolve it to some new state psi prime let's say what happens we get some new set of coefficients right alpha prime beta prime right at some time uh whatever t is equal to t prime something like that now remember that these coefficients 
they have an interpretation right what is that interpretation the interpretation is that uh, alpha square is the probability of measuring the system or finding the system in the up state and beta amplitude square is the probability of finding the system in the down state right so after this time evolution has happened these probabilities will change so now these are the new probabilities right now but probability satisfy this very basic uh, axiom right uh that probability is at to 1 right so all the possible outcomes of your system the probability of of each outcome and all of them taken together they should all add to 1 so it follows that your chain system should also satisfy the same requirement right so we cannot have a situation where uh this is not true okay so because if let's say uh this is not true okay if let's say alpha or beta prime square plus beta prime square is something less than 1 right then what this what this tells us is that i can take this state psi prime right so psi prime and and i can i can expand it by adding some third component which is orthogonal to the previous two components which are already there okay why is it not undoing some third component which was already not there, which was not there previously right so this is a new degree of freedom that we have added to the system and similarly if alp uh, if the sum of the amplitudes is less than okay so yeah theta square is less than 1 and so if the sum of the amplitudes is 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 uh, sorry okay this was greater than 1 then i'm saying yeah so the undo thing i have to be careful because it's on a page wise basis rather than a completely sequential okay and so if similarly if this is less than 1 then what that means is that we are missing some degree of freedom right whatever information was there it has been reduced okay and uh so probability is not being conserved okay and so we don't we don't we don't want such kind of evolution all right so we want to ensure that this is preserved excuse me and sir Yes, sir. This uh, it, alpha da, alpha da, dash square plus beta dash square will be less than one. Then only we'll be able to add no, no. new degree of freedom, na? Huh? Because then that new degree of freedom. Some... Ah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, yeah, you're right. I yeah, I'm just still getting used to this new uh, writing this thing. The undo behavior is a little bit uh, confusing, so I was distracted because of that. so um so ha, ha, another way to to say the same thing is that the norm of the state should not change under time evolution okay and the new state remember was given by some operator 
acting on the original state right and so we can write psi t prime adjoint of this state as the adjoint of this expression so the adjoint of this expression is going to be adjoint psi t and then we take the adjoint of this operator right again as a very minor sidebar uh, for those of you still struggling with the notation if i have a matrix and i multiply it by a vector right and then i take the transpose of both sides what does that do i have to change the ordering of the matrix and the vector right so this is exactly what is happening here only difference is that in addition there is a complex conjugation going on all right and so this implies that psi t this is equal to right so this this is the this is the new norm this is the norm of the new state and this is the norm of the old state and they both have to be equal to each other right and this implies that this u dagger times u has to be equal to the identity operator right which means that u dagger is equal to u inverse right and so such operators are known as unitary if the adjoint of an operator is equal to its inverse okay and why are unitary operators important because well quantum gates operations or uh, are represented by unitary operators okay so this is obviously you know from a computational perspective this is very important all right uh, then there are there is an exercise in the in the text uh, there are some exercises on on unitary operators and tensor products uh, so last time i had given you exercises uh till 2.25 uh today you should following today's lecture you should do the exercises 2.26 and i'm just going to write write down all the exercises because really all of them are essential unless you have picked up enough of the material and you're comfortable with something and you're like okay i know what what's going on all right so one of those exercises uh well maybe not one of those exercises one second okay so i don't know which exercise but this is i'll i'll just give it exercise show that the eigen values of a unitary operator are of the form e to the i theta okay so operators have eigen values which are complex numbers right unitary operators 
this statement is that the eigenvalue of a unitary operator is always a complex number with unit norm, right? So if you look at the complex plane, yeah, see, this is nice, right? <laughs> That's the benefit of this uh, new piece, new app that I'm using, that it has this nice, uh, geometric uh, so this is okay unless you want to go back to the original thing just one no one second yeah so this corresponds to z is equal to one right this is r is z I am said, right? This is the complex plane. Okay, so <clears throat> what next? Projectors. Um, so, okay, before, before that, let me uh, actually um, Tell you a little bit more about the the Schrodinger equation because it it is relevant in the context of uh, unitary operators. So we have this this expression, and this expression can be solved exactly when this matrix H, when this matrix H is not time dependent. When it's not time dependent, this Equation has a very simple solution, which is exponent minus i t by h bar h i t. Uh, sorry. So I should write this as h psi um, So, okay, let me. I t prime is equal to exponent minus i t prime minus t h by h bar by t. So this is the solution of this equation. And this this operator, right? So this this guy I've written over here, right? This is an operator. This is an operator. And uh, this is called the time evolution operator. Okay. And it is a unitary operator. The reason it's a unitary operator is the following. What is H? H is the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian Right, it measures the energy of the system. It measures the the total energy. Right, so that means it corresponds to an observable, something that you can actually measure. And since this is an observable, it has to correspond to, it has to be a Hermitian operator. Okay, so this is something that I should have mentioned in the context of Hermitian operator. So Hermitian operators correspond to observable quantities, right? So this means that since it's Hermitian, that means H adjoint is equal to H, right? That's the Hermitian property. So if I take an operator, if I take the exponential of this operator, So I take the exponential of I times H. I'll ignore the T and H bar because they don't matter in this case, right? And I take the adjoint of this, of this whole expression. 
right? So this is also a, an operator. This is also a matrix, right? So again, a small sidebar is that if you have any matrix, the exponential of that is also a matrix, which is given by the by this one second please. so if you take the adjoint of of this expression so this is an operator so if i take the adjoint of this expression it it becomes the exponential of the adjoint okay so the again if you don't know how this is happening convince yourself right by writing down the taylor series expansion of this exponential term by term take the adjoint of each term and then similarly write down the taylor series expansion of this and you will see that they are the same okay and again please let me stress that if these explanations are too quick for you or you feel that you know i'm not doing uh, it justice you please let me know okay and let me check mentimeter in case anybody has any um, nobody has any uh, nobody's used it actually in fact so okay if anybody wants to ask something anonymously they can use that so if i take the adjoint of this exponential i get i h adjoint and this becomes e to the minus i h right so h adjoint is equal to h that's the hermitian property and the i i have to put a minus sign right complex conjugation and this operator e to the minus i h if i multiply it with e to the minus with e to the i h what do i get i get the identity right so this operator uh this operator if i call it the the time evolution operator then this is the inverse of the time evolution right and what i've just shown is that the inverse can be obtained by taking the hermitian adjoint right so this implies that the time evolution is given by a unitary operator okay so you can you can uh, you can work either way you can either say that quantum states are described by uh, the dynamics is described by the schrodinger equation and uh, any quantum computation is in fact just dynamics of 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 a quantum state is just the time evolution of quantum state and where uh, the various gates correspond are given by some hamiltonian acting on our, on our qubits and so that implies that our gates have to be unitary operators or you could say that well from this idea that uh, we are not introducing or removing any degrees of freedom from the system and so probability must be conserved this implies that the evolution of the quantum system must be unitary right so we can summarize this as unitary evolution conserves total probability okay okay all right then we'll go on and talk about projectors okay now 
so what what is a projection right when you say that you are projecting something what what does that mean right so again let's say that we have uh we have a vector okay this is our vector and i can this vector has some components right and these components are let's say this is the vector v this is vx this is vy right so i would how would i uh, determine the value of vx i would take my vector v and i would take the dot product of the vector with the unit x direction vector right so what i'm doing is right i am projecting v onto the x axis right so that is what projection does projection takes so you take some arbitrary state okay this is some arbitrary state in your hilbert space okay and then you take some other arbitrary state okay so these are two arbitrary states and then so i can write psi in the following way i can write it as alpha phi plus beta phi perpendicular okay and i can do this for any state in terms of vectors these these ordinary real vectors that you are all comfortable with what does this correspond to i have some vector a and some vector b right and i can always take a and write it as a sum of vector b plus another vector which is perpendicular to b so di diagrammatically how does that look like this it looks like this you have a vector a and you have a vector b right so this is a and this is b and one we will have the the orthogonal vector right there will be a unique orthogonal vector to b so i am calling it b perpendicular so i can always take my vector a right and project it so that one component lies parallel to b and the other component lies perpendicular to b right okay i don't mind messing around too much with the colors sorry right so i can always take my vector a and project it so that one component is perpendicular to b and the other component is parallel to b right so i can write this parallel part as let's say alpha and the perpendicular part is beta right so it's exactly the same thing that i'm doing with these quantum states i can take any quantum state any two quantum state and i can write one state in terms of a component along the other one and a component perpendicular to the okay now the question is that if you are given two such states how can you determine this this alpha right this projection so in this case how to determine alpha right well let me uh, so 
so i have shown you before earlier that we can take any any vector it can be the same vector or you can take two different vectors and you can make a matrix out of that right this is a matrix right now i take this matrix and i act on my state sign okay and my state psi i have written i can write in this way right okay now what is the action of this p psi on the first part on this on this phi unit vector right and assuming that phi is is a uh, unit uh, length this just becomes phi assuming that the norm of phi is 1 right and what is the action so this i can write as p phi acting on p phi acting on phi what about p phi acting on phi perpendicular right what is this well this is going to be zero right because by definition these two states are orthogonal to each other so if i take p phi and act on psi what does that leave me with it leaves me with alpha well it leaves me with alpha times phi right again um so i am taking my uh phi to have unit norm okay and so this is called a projection operator all right and the projection operators have some proper some one property which is that if you take the square of the projection operator you get the same operator okay and it's uh, again you can work that out explicitly so this is also an exercise in this cat uh, note cat adjoint cat notation right this is one copy of p psi and then i act on another copy of p psi with this right so what happens now here i can take this fellow and this fellow right and i can write this inner product here and then i'm left with these two uh parts outside and this is equal to 1 right because i have said this is the norm is these are normalized vectors right so this is equal to the projector itself okay and projectors will become very important when we in particular uh when we talk uh, uh about measurement because what measurement does measurement uh takes your quantum state and it projects it quantum state and returns the amplitude associated with that with that component
again if if some of, if if they, these uh, this terminology is not clear to you hopefully with time it will become more clear okay all right so so these are uh, projection operators and um let's see right so now we can try to well i'll i'll do a few exercises from the book okay so exercise 2.30 uh well okay so before that we have to talk about tensor products we haven't talked about tensor products so i'll talk about tensor products first and then we'll talk about right so i have talked about unitary operators and about projectors now the remaining uh concept is that of a tensor product which i have talked about a little bit before uh but maybe not in uh in complete detail okay one second okay so tensor products all right and like i said at the um, in a little bit earlier this tensor product is the fundamental building it, it is what allows us to build build composite quantum systems and it allows us to do quantum computation okay so what is a what is a tensor product okay let me uh, give you the the technical definition okay so let v and w be vector spaces of dimension m and n okay then the tensor product is written as v uh and the symbol that is used for the tensor product is this multiplication cross with a circle around it and we it is we read this as v tensor w the tensor product which is read as v tensor w is a vector space of dimension m times n okay if i right where where this set uh, where in this uh, state i goes from 1 to m is a basis of v and j is the basis of w then the basis of this tensor product space v v tensor w is written as i tensor j so this is the basis of v tensor w okay now um let me just recall i had talked about tensor products uh so let me just go back and remind myself exactly what i had told you so i can maybe save a little bit of time yeah two state system no no not that not that not that Ha huh. yeah so uh, yeah okay i talked about this in the context of hilbert space being big right 
okay all right yeah so i guess we'll talk about it in greater detail now okay so we'll consider an example of this examples are the best way to understand a concept right we consider two vector spaces and for simplicity we'll consider both those vector spaces to be two dimensional okay so v and w are two dimensional vector spaces okay and so i will write the basis of v again as my up and down states let's say i'll write it like up a and down a well actually i mean it's too many symbols maybe better to just call them a and b so these two states are a basis of a and these two states are a basis of b with respective basis vectors okay and again what are these if you want to write them in components right it would just be okay something like this but again please keep in mind remember a and b need not be of the same size okay or have the same basis vectors i have only uh, chosen them to be of the same size for convenience okay so for example in this in this situation that i have over here in the above i could have taken my basis of b to be something else right i could have taken it to be these states instead right these two are also orthogonal vectors okay so just please keep that in mind so these are my basis vectors of a and b right now a tensor b is a how many dimensional vector space it's a four dimensional vector space right and what are the basis vectors the basis vectors are we can write them as follows 1a 1b 1a down b right down a up b and down a down b right so of course in this case i'm i'm just writing all of them out but in general you don't need to do that that's why we have used this notation i tends to d where is understood that i goes from 1 to n i goes from 1 to m and j goes from 1 to n okay and if you want to make it even clearer you can put some sort of a label here to indicate 
that you are talking about a vector space V and a vector space W. Okay. So these are the these are the basis vectors. Okay. And now, how how do I uh, uh, what is the you know, if, if, I, if I want to talk about it in terms of components, right? So I'm saying this is a four dimensional vector space. So what are the components? So these vectors, all of these vectors, these are four dimensional vectors, right? So what are the components of these vectors, right? right. So what is the components of this vector, right? In A tensor B. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. What was A? Up A was one zero. Tensor product with one zero. Okay. So the operation of tensor product is given as follows. Okay. Let me use colors again. Let me make this blue, let's say. Uh, no, not this blue. This blue. I'll make this green. Okay, hopefully that's not too. So this consists of the following. You take the one. And the zero, and you multiply them in this way, in the way that I have shown. Make this red. Lots of colors are there, hopefully, to make things simpler and not to confuse you. Okay, so then what does this become? This becomes one zero 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 zero. Right, this is a four dimensional vector. I've given you the components explicitly. What if I had used a different basis? If up B, right, I had used a different basis was one one. Then what would be the uh, components of this, it would be one, so it would be one by root two, one by root two, zero, zero. Okay, so this would be if I had used this different basis for uh, the B Hilbert space or the B vector space. Okay. So the, so this is the this is the tensor product. Now in general, given any two matrices. Uh, any two uh, matrices, and they don't have to be rectangular, okay? So A is an M by N matrix, and B is a P by Q matrix, right? Then we can take the tensor product of these two, and the tensor product will be a matrix, which is of dimension MP number of rows and NQ number of columns. And the elements of this matrix will be given as follows. A11 times P, A11, 12 times P, 
a one n times p a m one times p a m two times p a m n times p. Okay. So this is the this is the so this is also known as the Kronecker product. Okay, so of course in our case uh, we will not have much occasion to use uh, rectangular matrices. We'll be using mostly square matrices. But this uh, Kronecker product is well defined for any arbitrary matrix. Okay. So, as another example, if you have a matrix, uh, if you have two vectors, let's say like this, the tensor product is given by 1 times 2, 1 times 3, 2 times 2, 2 times 3. Right? equal to two, three, four. Another example, and I'm just taking these straight from uh, Nielsen and Chuang is the following. So remember we introduced the poly Z matrix, just this. Then there are two other very important matrices, which is the X matrix and the Y matrix and the Y matrix is this, okay? So very often we'll be taking tensor products of these matrices, okay? So as an example, uh, what is the tensor product of Z with X, right? So again, using the Z11 times X, Z12 times X, Z21 times X, and Z22 times X. Okay, so now many of you might find all of this very childish and boring, uh, but uh, you know, um, if you don't understand this stuff, then well, quantum computation is not going to make much sense to you, okay? So what is Z11 times X? Z11 is uh, one times X is 0, 1, 1, 0. So here I put 0, 1, 1, 0. Then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then we have a minus one so we get zero minus one minus one and zero. Okay, so this, this is the tensor product for, of uh, Z with X. All right. Um, so I, uh, told you to do these exercises, right? Exercises 2.26 to 2.33. Um, I will uh, do a couple here um, just to get you started, okay? So let's see, exercise uh, 2.30 show that the tensor product of two Hermitian matrices is Hermitian. Okay. So similarly, the other exercises are along the same line. So that the tensor product of two unitary matrices is unitary 
tensor product of two positive operators is positive, tensor product of two projectors is a projector. Okay, just to show you that the tensor product preserves all these important properties of any matrix. Okay, so we have two matrices, A and B, and they are both Hermitian. Okay. So I want to uh, show that the tensor product of these two matrices is Hermitian. Now the tensor product is given by, right? I'll write it as A tensor B. And what I want to show is the following, right? Right, I want to show that a tensor B adjoint is equal to A tensor B. Okay. Well, first let me make the following statement that the adjoint of the tensor product is equal to the tensor product of the adjoint. Okay. This is, I, I'm, I'm claiming this, okay? Once I claim this, then we have made, we have proved, right? Similarly, the other exercises are along similar lines. Show that if A is unitary, A and B are unitary, show that A tensor B is also unitary. That means A B inverse is equal to A B adjoint, okay? So A B adjoint would be uh, A adjoint, tensor B adjoint and A adjoint is A inverse. This is tensor B inverse. Okay, so the basic statement, what lies at the, at the, you know, what is shared by all of these expressions, right, is the following, that all of these operations such as the transpose, complex conjugation, uh, and adjoint. Well, if transpose and conjugation satisfy this, then adjoint automatically satisfies it. Distribute over the tensor product. Okay, so what do we mean by distribute, right? Distribute, distribution means the following, right? That if I take this complex conjugate, I can apply this complex conjugate to each one of these operators. If I take the transpose, the transpose distributes to each one of these. And if you combine both of these operations, then you get that the adjoint also transposes. Uh, distributes. And once you do that, then well, everything else follows. Okay. So, so let, let's look at this first one. A tensor B uh, complex conjugate. Okay. Now what was A tensor B? It was A11B to A1 M B A N one B and A N M B. Okay, I've gotten my N and M switched over, doesn't matter. So I take the complex conjugate of this. What is the complex conjugate? Well, the complex conjugate of a matrix 
is just the complex conjugate of all the components of the matrix, right? So this becomes A11B, one, one B, B conjugate, A11, one, one, right? Okay, and what is this? This is A conjugate, tensor B conjugate. Okay, the, the transpose is uh, probably going to be a little bit more tricky than this. So I'll leave that for you, okay? And I'll stop here for the day. Okay, questions? Yeah, if you have to leave, that's fine. It's not an issue uh, if people have other things to take care of. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> so please uh, do these exercises which I've given to you. Your reading um, for this uh, for this lecture. Well, so all so far, what we have been doing is we have just been working with. Uh, the mathematical basics and all of that is in section 2.1 of Nielsen and Schwann. Okay, of course you can find this uh, material in many places, not just in Nielsen and Schwann. So if you have some other or you can look at other sets of lectures on YouTube. Many, many people, uh, some very, very, very famous physicists have also, uh, you know, recorded sets of lectures. In fact, instead of watching my lecture, you could just learn quantum computation watching theirs. Um, but unfortunately, you won't get credit uh, for watching their lectures. So. Okay. All right then. Okay. Bye bye.